Hey, everybody. Welcome. Glad to have you back here on another Edgy Stream. And who are these two handsome gentlemen joining me on the screen? I'm, I'm, I'm sure some of you might know them, some of you don't. But I'll tell you what, if you have any kind of interest in FCS in-state uh, football, of course, talking Eastern, Southern, Western, Illinois State, you need to know these guys because they have done a terrific job covering FCS football here in the state of Illinois for a long time and just uh, really happy to bring them on board. Of course, uh, Dan Verdon joining us. Uh, and Dan, again, has been covering – well, you tell us, Dan. It's been a while. You've been at this for a while as far as the uh, in-state and the FCS recruiting is concerned and football is concerned. Well, Barry and I both have backgrounds covering FCS, you know, from our undergraduate days. And, uh, you know, Barry will tell you about himself here in a minute. But, yeah, I've written, uh, you know, a handful of books uh, featuring – there we go. There's one of them. Your alma mater. <laughs> And uh, yeah, so we've we've been doing the blog now uh, for a few years and, and really enjoy it. Barry, uh, again, most people are probably familiar with your work with Shaw Media. You're on campus column, which I've read for a long time. And uh, you also have, have been on this for a while. So the first thing I want to know about, how do you two come together to do this? Well, I think the, the great way to start was we... Um, we were always looking for FCS scores and information, yep. you know, just as fans. Um, and five, six years ago, we would get our Sunday papers, the Chicago Metro papers. Uh, and the only thing you could really find on an in-state FCS game, sometimes between two state schools, was a score. Yeah. Um, and we felt like there was a little more to tell there. Uh, so we wanted to do this and, and kind of launch the blog that way. And, and it's been great. And you, you're, you guys are right. And, and sadly, and again, we can do a whole discussion on the downcline of media and how things are disappearing. But especially when it comes to FCS, I mean, it's really hard to find stuff in a newspaper these days. And I get it. I mean, the cutbacks, we're all familiar with what's been going on from the media side. But, uh, you know, you mentioned you really back then you really had to struggle to find stuff. And, and let's face it. OK. Yeah, a lot of people go to U of I or they go to Northwestern or, or even Northern Illinois. But I hate to tell you, but a lot of us didn't. And a lot of us went to Eastern and Western and Southern and Illinois State. And I tell you what, we're just as passionate about our teams and our schools as, as they are at the bigger schools. So, no, I as a fan of FCS, obviously, as Dan mentioned, I'm a huge SIU salam. And um, I just appreciate the work all these years you guys put, has put into it because it's been great. I mean, it, it's been a uh, – it's a platform for that school, that football, and obviously Eastern in the Ohio Valley. But when, when you're talking Missouri Valley with football guys, I mean, it, it's been mentioned it's the SEC of FCS, and I really think it is. It's great football. Yeah, absolutely. I think one interesting thing, you know, Tim, you mentioned the the blog, and uh, it's called Prairie State Pigskin. Yep. And we've heard from a lot of coaches uh you know, that have kind of told us they really enjoy what we do. And it gives them an opportunity to learn about the other state schools uh, that they may not see. And we, we found that they're really welcoming to what we're doing. Yeah. And and, it, and it's it's getting the word out. I mean, it's so important. And, you know, the less the less outlets there are, the less kids are going to hear about this stuff. And yeah, I, I agree. And, and just from the alumni standpoint alone, like I mentioned, I mean, there's I run into people every day that will tell me, oh, yeah, I'm a huge ISU fan or I'm a huge Eastern Illinois or Western Illinois. And, you know, they follow a lot of the stuff. And, again, they still struggle finding it. But they can find you guys now and, and certainly certainly get filled in. Uh, we mentioned Prairie State Pigskin blog, which you can find on Chicago now. Just Google it. You'll find it. Prairie State Pigskin. That, that's what I do all the time. and just Google it, and I find it. So – Obviously, with early signing day uh, back on Wednesday, um, you know, let's go through. I know you guys split it up, so we'll go through each of the classes. And um, actually, my ISU's out, my SIU's out, and I'm uh, in the middle of wrapping up Eastern, so I'll have my Eastern out later today. Um, Barry, I'll start with you with Illinois State. And sure. I'll be honest. I really think from an in-state perspective, this might be one of the stronger classes Brock's back has had. Is that kind of the vibe and the feeling you got from them on Wednesday? Yeah. Yeah, I think it is. And just referring to a few notes here, um, 20 kids in the class, 18 signed letters of intent, two preferred walk-ons. Um, and one thing that I mentioned on the blog the other day was they 
had kids from Rockford to O'Fallon. Uh, yeah. So kids all around the state. Uh, nine kids from Illinois high schools. Um, and I, I wanted to mention a couple interesting items that, that Brock Spack mentioned on Wednesday was that number one, uh, they got an a, uh, offensive lineman from St. Rita named Bowden Turner. Uh, he said it was really uh, good for them to get into the Catholic League and pull a kid out of the Catholic League. Um, and, you know, as Dan and I know, that's been a mantra of Adam Cushing at EIU, who played at Mount Carmel, to really kind of make some inroads into the Catholic League. So I think that's a, an, an obvious, you know, nice get for Illinois State there. Um, the other one I wanted to mention was a running back, and Illinois State has been known for running backs in recent yeah. years. Obviously, James Robinson is having huge success in the NFL in his rookie season. A kid named Sean Allen from Homewood Flossmoor ran for 2,000 yards as a junior. Um, and, and that's a, a great get for them. They also pulled a kid out of Indiana who is really successful. Um, interesting thing about the running backs there is there are currently eight running backs on the roster, uh, one senior. So that's a loaded position. Yeah. And, and Spack said that, um, you know, we've had a reputation now of, of producing great tailbacks here. So obviously kids know about us and want to come here. Um, he also mentioned that those guys, you know, as you know, Tim, could also become safeties. They could also become yeah. linebackers. So they can positionally, uh, positional flexibility is huge uh, for anybody walking into a college program, and that helps them an awful lot. They also had two two quarterbacks in this class, and and Spec said that they they weren't sure they would take two, but they got two commitments. So they took both, including Rittenhouse, the kid from Wheaton St. Francis, who um, they really like, and uh, that's also a crowded position. They have five um, current. Yeah quarterbacks on the roster um, and only one senior. So that's also a crowded spot there at ISU. Yeah. I, uh, first of all, Sean Allen was my, I guess I'll call him the headliner of the class. Okay. Uh, there's a kid that had legitimate Mac offers and mm -hmm. a, a lot of high level FCSs. I know North Dakota state sniffed around him. Um, and, and really, and, and again, and this is going to be a theme I think for this class in particular and probably for 2022, but as far as the whole COVID related with recruiting, and I know every coach talked about how they had to change their process and had to get creative with things. Um, Sean Allen was a kid that for whatever reason, he had those early offers. He kind of held off on committing anywhere. Uh, I think like a, a lot of other kids, I think he had bigger aspirations and was holding out for a bit. And that really cost him from a scholarship standpoint. And, and again, he was a kid I projected as a mid FBS kid to wind up at Illinois state, as you mentioned, Barry, that's a really nice get for Brock's back. Yeah. And, um, you mentioned Rittenhouse. I love him. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, he's not, it's funny because I went to a throwing session up at uh, next level, uh, which Greg Holcomb's placed one of the quarterback coaches. And it was, so it was JJ McCarthy it was Caden Cobb, who's a 2022, who's going to be a mm -hmm. four-star kid. And then it was Tommy Rittenhouse. And right there, guys, you could see the difference between a power five quarterback, power five quarterback, and a kid playing FCS football. And it's no knock on Tommy at all. Mm -hmm. it's just, Tommy doesn't have that, that bigger frame and is not quite as thick or as strong as the other two. But guys, when it comes to throwing the ball and making plays and, and his ability just to to just he, he just plays at a really high level and makes every throw those other guys make. And, you know, again, you mentioned that position is crowded and anything can happen with quarterbacks and, and our the ever popular transfer portal. You're going to see kids pop in and out of the transfer portal. And, and I just think Tommy's one of those kids when it's all said and done, he could wind up playing really well and probably playing a uh, probably a significant role for them. And then yeah. as far as the, the rest of the class is concerned, I mean, Ryan, Gut and I'm going to butcher this last name. I know the kid out of Hersey. Goditis. Yeah. Yeah. yeah he was, he was the kid that spec mentioned and, and they brought in some bigger kids size wise. They have a six, six, three, 10 kid out of, out of Michigan. Uh, and he said, uh, spec said, yeah, they have some size. But Goditis is a kid I think can develop quickly. And I thought that was interesting for him to note that. Yeah. And, and he's one of those kids that will continue to get bigger and grow. Mm -hmm. In two years, he might be a 300 pounder, just the yeah. way he's built. So, yeah, that's, uh, he'll be exciting. And the other thing I want to know is, is, is what is Brock's fascination with landing a, a, a kid that no one's heard of every signing class? <laughs> I mean, every signing class. 
he digs out a kid. I mean, I remember we had the Buffalo meat kid. Oh, we Buffalo yeah. meat, sure. I no, think, I I think he's us. playing NAIA basketball now, I believe. Yeah. yeah. I mean, no one will ever forget that name from Saturday. Right. And then he turned around in this year and got a tight end out of uh, his old stomping grounds out of the yes. I, I believe. Yeah. Yeah. That the kid, he, he, he mentioned that kid and that's um, looking at my notes here, Jarrett straight Lutzo, who is six, seven. And he said he hasn't played a lot of football, um, but he liked his frame. And, and obviously when you're, when you're projecting kids two or three years down the road, you're looking at frame and whether they can put weight yeah. on that. So that was obviously an interesting item. A little bit of breaking news with ISU today. Uh, we're talking on the 22nd of December, uh, their running backs coach and recruiting coordinator, Keenan Hall, who was a, was a really instrumental in bringing kids in from his home area in Dallas and kids around Texas has left the program. Uh, we don't know where to yet, but Tim, as you, you, you sure, you sure know that after signing day, coaches start moving around a little bit. So they're, they're signing day yeah. on that Wednesday and then it's moving day on that yeah. Thursday. So. so interesting enough that the new running backs coach that was announced today is Sam O'Jury, who's from Barrington, uh, played at North Dakota State, played a little in the CFL. So interesting move there for ISU. And a really nice hire. Sam's a guy that, um, you know, last stop was Wyoming, as you mentioned, mm -hmm. North Dakota State. And uh, recruiting wise is doing a real nice job for for Wyoming. So I think he's going to be a really nice fit for ISU for sure. I'll be right. interested though uh, with with Hall, Hall pulled a lot of guys out of Texas and yeah. it'll be interesting to see what happens with that now. All right. We've spent probably 10 minutes too long on Illinois State. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm, I'm kidding, Brock. Seriously, I'm kidding. Uh, Dan, we'll go to you and, and, and I would grade this probably the second best signing class, in my opinion, in the state of Illinois out of the FCS is with Eastern Illinois. I mean, when Adam Cushing came in, he said that, you know, and, and they're all going to say they're going to make in-state recruiting a priority. I mean, Lovey Smith in some ways said that when he first took the job over. We kind of saw how that went, but we'll save that for some time. Bielema uh, said it this week, too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, again, uh, 23 kids signed Eastern Illinois. I know that eight were in-state. And, and just overall, be, besides the numbers of in-state, Dan, I just like the overall quality of the class for the Panthers. Well, as you mentioned, you know, a lot of coaches have said, you know, we're going to recruit Illinois, but Cushing and his staff, as you know, you know, came from Northwestern, a majority of his staff. So they already have those connections made. And so it makes perfect sense for them to, you know, instead of routing kids to Evanston, now they're going to, you know, get some heading to Charleston. And, uh, you know, he's really made a commitment to the younger younger class. I think Barry will probably back me up on this. I want to say there were something like 80 kids that were either true freshmen, redshirt freshmen, sophomores or redshirt sophomores. I mean, it was huge numbers. And there were times last year that, uh, you know, the five offensive linemen were all freshmen. So obviously, you know, Cushing's trying to build something there. Yeah. And, you know, again, it's, after taking the program over, you know, you're, you got to give him time to, to, as we mentioned, kind of reload and build up some depth. And, and Dan, I would think this class on top of what they've already been able to do. Um, it's, I, I think now, I think we're all looking for, let's kind of find the next step. Was that kind of maybe alluded to a little bit when he talked about this group overall? Definitely. And, you know, obviously any football team needs depth, but you know, the, the thing that's kind of hurt Eastern over the years is the two lines. I mean, they've had some they've had some strong players one way or another, but it's been a while since they've had a really strong, significant offensive line overall and defensive line. And as you know, if, if you don't have those, it's pretty difficult to, to have success. So you mentioned, you know, 23 players, three of them were transfers. The three transfers were all offensive linemen, two yeah. from junior college and one from Kent State. Um, so I think he realizes, yeah, I'm playing these young guys, but we also need some guys who have, have matured, developed, and are ready to, to step into those positions. And again, that idea of depth. Yeah, you mentioned you mentioned the three transfers. And, and Dan, I'll be honest, out of all the kids that signed, uh, Mike McNicholas might wind up being one of the headliners of this class. He was a great, really impressive player at Montini. Went to Kent State, and I don't know whatever went down there, but uh, you know, to get a kid of that caliber going down to Eastern Illinois, um, he's definitely a name to watch. 
from from the high school side, I mean, a kid like Jason Moore out of De La Salle, the running back, I mean, he's another kid I kind of scratch my head and think, wow, what pe some people were missing on this kid because early on he had the Iowa States and, and he had some of the bigger FBS schools taking a look at him. And, you know, for whatever reason, he ended up dropping down a bit. And again, we talked about COVID and how things filled up quickly. And, and another thing about, and we didn't even get, get into this, but with the whole super senior concept where, you know, your seniors are basically allowed to come back for another year. You know, that, that had a big impact on the FBS level as far as scholarships and what they could sign. I think you're going to see, and we've already seen some of the FCS schools kind of benefit. And I think a kid like Jason Moore, Dan, going to Eastern Illinois, I think that's a real benefit for Eastern. And I think an example of uh, maybe a COVID related issue, why he wound up going to the FCS level. They also really loaded up at defensive back. I mean, uh, I think two of the guys were listed as safeties, but I think they brought in six overall. And there's been a lot of talk about Tolbert, the linebacker out of uh, yeah. Thornton Township as well. Yeah, yeah he um, he actually had transferred to Hillcrest. Um, he was going to end up finishing his senior year at Hillcrest, and I think he actually will graduate. And if we play in the spring, uh, he'll play he'll play for Hillcrest. But yeah, technically he was a Thornton Township kid. And again, he's the athlete. You know what I mean? He's six one, like two twenty, two twenty five. Really runs well. And and yeah, just overall, I. I, I just like like the overall depth of what he's made. It brings in a kicker from Mount Carmel and, right. uh, yeah. you know, Julian Patino, um, you know, also uh, uh, Leon Cog Cognahan, or I believe it's Cognahan out of out of Loyola. And, again, you mentioned those Catholic League ties, and, and there's a kid coming out of Loyola, and believe me, Kush will take any kid possible he can grab out of Loyola, I think, year in and year out if, if those kids are willing to uh, – make the trip down to Charleston. So, yeah, I mean, Dan, your thoughts overall on the class? I mean, I just overall, I, I'd feel pretty good if I'm a, a Panther fan looking at what they signed. Yeah, I do too. And I think, you know, you mentioned the kicker out of his alma mater. I think a lot of times people kind of overlook kickers, but if, you've got, got a, if you've got a good kicker, yeah. that that changes your offense in so many ways. Yeah, I'm a yeah, bear special fan. Teams has not been, uh, special teams has not been a strength for Eastern over the last, you know, decade or so. So that is huge. Yeah, there's there's no doubt. Um, Dan, were there, were there discussions at all about maybe what could be done for the next go around or, or the final signing period? And Barry, I'll throw that at you as well with Illinois State. Was there talk of, well, we're kind of done, but we're not exactly done. Because let's face it, these guys are like poker players. You know, they've got one or two up their sleeve if they need it. For we sure. Get, you know, you get a lot of the coach speak where, you know, we're, we'll never say we're done. We're always looking. And then, mm -hmm. of course, you extend that into the summer where you get the FBS transfers as well. And, yeah. and both schools have had some success with those. And both schools have also had some failures with those. Yeah, I think one thing that SPAC mentioned was that that – you know, I, I'm always interested to see the 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 play between the December signing date and the January signing date, especially in the FCS, because these classes are bigger in December now. And SPAC mentioned, uh, you know, we only have a few spots left and mainly we'll be looking for defensive linemen. So, you know, I, I'm sure that was a shout out to some Illinois kids, you know, <laughs> uh, but, I, but I thought that was interesting. That you mentioned that. Yeah. So. Yeah, and, and again, I talked a little bit about the transfer portal and. I mean, with all this going on, and it's been amazing to see all these names wind up in the portal. You know, there's a lot of guys out there that are not going to find spots. And and Absolutely. that's where FCS schools and D2s, I think, are really going to clean up as well. So it's uh, you're right. It's going to be interesting to see how things shake down. By the way, I got to throw this out here since we're talking FCS football. That little school in green, wearing the Green Bay Packer colors that seem to win a national championship every year, that would be in the Missouri Valley. Oh, those guys. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, those guys. They 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 picked up a transfer out of Virginia Tech, a quarterback named Quincy Patterson. Mm -hmm. uh, I could I could hear the thud, the the fist hitting the desk around the Missouri Valley when they saw yeah. Quincy Patterson going to North Dakota State. Guys, I tell you what, that is a transfer that could end up being a major major impact guy for North Dakota State. And again, when you when you think about the bison, you think of their offense and you know kind of a more pro style attack and, and running game and which I'm sure they're still going to do. 
But you put a kid like Quincy Patterson running that offense who can also yeah. run, and, and I make the comparisons to, I don't know if you guys remember Aaron Bailey. Oh, yeah. Sure. Played Absolutely. in Illinois, played at Bolingbrook in a state title team, then transferred to Northern Iowa and had some success. Mm -hmm. That caliber of quarterback where he can do everything. He can sit in the pocket and throw, but he's athletic enough where he can run RPO. He can do a ton of stuff. Yeah. So and you put him in a dome. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. In a dome in a great offense already. And yeah, and, the rich and we know Trey Lance is gone. So mm -hmm. yeah. So the rich get richer in North Dakota State. So I thought I'd bum all of you <laughs> Surrey Valley fans out when I threw that one out there. Barry, uh, Southern Illinois, my Saluki, it's a, a decent class. Personally, a little disappointed with the two in-state signings, but uh, I love both kids that they signed. But kind of what was the vibe from uh, Nick Sell's presser on Wednesday? Yeah, I know it's it's their classes have seemed to kind of lean south. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, you have four kids from Tennessee in this class. Uh, you know, you have two from Georgia, you have two from Florida. They always do well in Florida, especially around the Orlando area. Um, those classes are kind of leaning a little bit south. He's had some success in Kentucky. Um, so I think that's interesting. Uh, the two Illinois kids, Sam Buck, an offensive lineman from Highland, Illinois, um, and Jalen Bates, a DB from Oak Park River Forest. Um, interesting thing about Bates, this is a five-member DB class that's coming in. And as you well know, Tim, um, DBs and SIU have had terrific success. They have four DBs in the NFL right now. Um, and they got a huge get uh, also with uh, James Caesar, who was in Hill's first recruiting class at SIU, left after he had an injury plagued season, went to Division II Ferris State in Michigan. He's from Detroit, was a first team D2 All-American last year, is coming back to Southern this year. That only makes that uh, secondary stronger. They also have Quay Brown coming back who played safety. And uh, two years ago when the NVFC decided they were moving their season, he got in the transfer portal, did not find what he liked there. So he's also coming back. And I think this this secondary is going to be the headliner of this defense. Yeah. I mean, you mentioned Chan and I'll show you my ID. I go back to uh, <laughs> Terry Taylor when he played on the uh, sure. SIU championship team, who was an NFL caliber corner. And yeah, it's, it's a position of strength for sure. Jalen Bates was my headliner. Um, okay. He was another, had Mac offers and a lot of interest. And, and again, was a kid that I think if we would have had a spring evaluation or a summer evaluation, he wouldn't have ended up at SIU. He would have ended yeah. up playing in the Mac somewhere or, or maybe even a little bit higher, maybe a lower tier big 10. Yeah. So he's that kind of an athlete, but I tell you what, if, if you're a Saluki fan, I mean, Sam Buck was born to be a Saluki. I mean, mm -hmm. loves the hunt, loves the fish, got yeah. the bullet. He's mean. Yeah. He's, uh, but he's a kid that just, you, kid has a smile on his face. I saw him at camps. I mean, he was just beating up everyone in front of him, just having a blast, just having a great time. And, and he's be a great kid. fit there. I yeah. know that I know that he's got some veterans in front of him from a death standpoint, but I tell you what, Barry, he's gonna come in and challenge right away. He's a kid yeah. that I wrote that eventually he's gonna be an all MDC kind of player. And you know, if again wasn't thrilled with the overall in state numbers, I know we'll we'll see where things shake out when it's all said and done after February. But uh, yeah. the two we signed I really liked. So. Yeah, I thought I thought Nick Hill made an interesting point, and this is kind of COVID related. You know, he said we couldn't get out and see kids. We couldn't have them on campus here with COVID. He made an interesting point. He said, in my high school career, my biggest leap was my junior year to my senior year. And he said, now kids here in Illinois don't have senior film right now. So that was an obvious impact, you know. There's um, evaluation. There, there's no yeah. doubt. And I get it. You know, it. it when you can go to Indiana and you can go down south to Florida and see these kids playing sure. out, I've got a recruiting board like everyone else. And, and if I like two or three out-of-state kids above, hey, I get it. So yeah. believe me, it's not a criticism at all. I get why. Yeah. And I guarantee you it, that happened many, many cases as well. Yeah. And as Dan mentioned, they're always busy year round, it seems. Uh, a couple days after signing day, they announced three Pretty more hard. guys. Yeah. You know, you have a you have a QB coming in who's from Tennessee, a transfer from Florida International. You have a, a prep quarterback from Alabama coming in and a JUCO linebacker coming in. So 
I think Nick Hill is one of those guys. He and his staff are always going to be looking. They're always going to be overturning, you know, any rock they can find. Uh, Dan, finally, Western Illinois, as, as we joked before we started recording this, you have a whole lot to cover on Wednesday. No, the last couple of years, uh, Jerry, Jared Elliott and his staff um, do not do not formally announce anything until February. They just kind of do it all at once. I don't um, – let me stop you there. I, I mean, I get it, and I'm sure they're working on stuff, and I'm sure there's some transfer kids involved, and they want to have everything lined up before they start rolling out. I get that, but it's gotten to the point where the first year you kind of understood it because I don't think any of us really knew the impact. I think, I mean, and we cover recruiting full-time at Rivals, and we were thinking maybe 50 55% of that available class that year would sign. Turn out being 75 to 80. So none of us really knew what to expect that first year. And then it went from like 75, 80 to 90. So, I mean, let's face it, this is kind of the event. And, and believe me, I'm not here to tell West Illinois what to do. But when the Joneses around you are having the ceremonies and announcing, Dan and Barry, I just I just think you've got to follow suit eventually. But sure. Dan, go right ahead. Well, that's, you know, obviously that's their decision to make, but uh, I, you definitely make a good point there. But there is a little bit of news. Um, they do have a an SEC transfer, um, a kid named uh, Jotavarius Whitlow, who in 2018 was the leading rusher for Auburn. Um, so they picked him up. He is enrolled in Macomb. He has two years of eligibility left. I mean, just the SEC pedigree, you you've got to envision that yep. he is going to be an impact player for them. Yep. Um, and then Elliot tweeted the other day that uh, Jalen Reed, kid out of East St. Louis, um, who Elliot in his tweet basically said, this is a guy with big play ability. I mean, he's not he's not very big. I think he's about 5'8", maybe 165 or so. But you got to think that there's maybe a little thunder and lightning combination there, so to speak. Of course, they did have the, uh, the, the loss of Clint Rakovich, the kid out of uh, Crete Moni, who has been an all Missouri Valley Mr. fullback. He's been Mr. WIU. <laughs> yeah. Well, he was he was named a captain as a sophomore and he was going to be a three-time captain. Um Barry and I've talked to him many, many times. Great kid. Yeah. Um, you know, I know it's been frustrating the last couple of seasons for him. You know, th that offense really has not done much of anything. So he put himself out there and he is now going to be a Northern Illinois Husky. Um, you mentioned Jalen Reed from East St. Louis. Um, he was like the third receiver in that offense. Um, the first one was a four-star ranked kid going to Missouri. The other one's a three-star ranked kid going to UCLA. So, you know, <laughs> you got to fight. You got to fight for your catches when when you, you got two major Power Five guys in the same uh, receiver rotation. And, and you mentioned the size. He's not a big kid, but but really quick and elusive. So that's a nice signing. And. And Clint, that you mentioned, I, I got to know Clint when he was at Crete Moni, and 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 kind of it reflected his career at Western Illinois. I mean, I mean, Clint did everything at Crete. I mean, you tell him to play offensive line, he go in and play offensive line, and probably play it pretty well. And yeah, that that's definitely a loss for sure. And just from a leadership standpoint, as I mentioned to me, it was like Mister Western Illinois the whole time. That's, that's a great description of him. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So we'll. We'll see how things shake out for the uh, Leathernecks once uh, we get to the February period for sure. Um, I'll throw this at you guys before I let you go. And again, it's been awesome having you guys, as I mentioned. Huge fan of your work, and, and I hope you guys continue to do this for a long, long time. Um, FCS football and, and, of course, being in the wonderful state of Illinois where we live, um, there's got to be concerns, guys, I would imagine. Barry, I'll start with you. There's got to be concerns from those levels just in the entire financial picture and what's going on with the schools, you know, not just enrollment wise, but I think financially state support, you've got to be concerned. I would imagine. Sure. I, I think that's, it's always been difficult. You know, when you see schools letting faculty go, when you see schools uh, you know, Dan and I both graduated at Eastern and, you know, staff members being let go. And, you know, we have a friend who's, wife as a faculty member, it's very difficult now uh, at those state schools. Um, and I think obviously at some point that's got to trickle down to athletics, um, you know, and no no ticket in income revenue. Um, 
you know, that, that I can't imagine what that's like to kind of put that forward. You know, I read something online yesterday that uh, the University of Iowa said, you know, their loss this year will take about 10 years to recover from financially. Yeah. And the state schools don't have those kind of resources. You know, Dan and I talk about this all the time. Other than in Bloomington Normal, uh, in Charleston and Macomb and in Carbondale, there's not a great amount of industry around there. So where does your business support from? Where do your large donations come from? You know, you have to really hit your alumni, some of whom may be struggling at this time. So it's it's incredibly difficult. And I would hate to see what it's going to impact, you know, with the state schools. And as Barry and I have talked about, so many of those schools, you may have had the husband who was working on grounds for the university, and the wife may have been an administrative yep. assistant in one of the departments, and one or both of them have lost their job. So yeah. there again, you know, there's a there's another impact. Yeah, there's there's no doubt. And um, was it just me? Was it really weird seeing like Southern Illinois play one game? <laughs> I mean, guys, what was there discussions? I mean, I you know, it, it just seemed like when it came to the FCS level, it was kind of, well, just go do what go do what you can do. And then I mean, I know there were some FCS schools that ended up playing like what five, six games. Yeah. And obviously others didn't play anything. And to me, it was just really strange. I think there were discussions. I don't think those discussions were public, but I think you know, all four of the schools probably batted around some ideas. Ultimately, as you said, only Southern ended up playing the game, and that was against, you know, their regional rival, Southeast Missouri, which turned out to be one thrilling game. I mean, we only had one great. cover yeah. one game. Yeah. It was a tremendous yeah. game. Yeah. Well, the, the wonderful, strange, wacky world of COVID. <laughs> Guys, great to have you. Um, I'm hoping we make this an every year thing, and uh, I definitely will stay in touch and Again, stay safe. Have a great holiday. And uh, hopefully uh, we get through this nonsense. We'll get to watch some football soon. You too. We can talk some White guys. Sox too. <laughs> hey, I'm all ready. Go I'm Sox. <laughs> Thank you, Tim. Thanks for having us. All right, guys. Thank you, Tim. you guys have a good one. Happy Thanks. holiday.